Welcome to War and Storytelling in Ukraine. And the title of this lecture, this is an open lecture of a course that I'm going to be teaching at Kiev Mohilanska Department of Journalism to the graduate students. Uh, but it's, I'm going to make it an open course to anyone in the university. Uh, and actually anyone in Kiev, Ukraine, or around the world that cares about the war in Ukraine and the, the history that's being written here. And this lecture is about three things. It's about war, it's about storytelling, and it's gonna be about the future of Ukraine's history. And those are the three things that we're gonna talk about in this, in this discussion or this, this lecture. Those are the three things that I'm gonna explore. First of all, I wanna talk about, and I wanna impose, I, I wanna talk to you about and impose my idea, and I say impose because I'm going to be very uh, dogmatic about this, that the greatest weapon of mass destruction in war is not the nuclear bomb, which everyone's talking about right now because of the potential, uh, but the greatest weapon in history of war, greatest weapon in human history ever invented is actually story. And the power of storytelling to mobilize people to fight and die for a cause, all right? To, to mobilize people to fight and die on a battlefield or in a war uh, for a country, uh, for an idea. And I, I wanna go through and, and share with you some stories about why that's, that, that is the case. And I'm gonna share, share that with you from my perspective, both as a former history teacher at the United States Military Academy at West Point, but also as a former army officer uh, who served in combat uh, two times in Iraq uh, as an officer. And finally, um, you know, why that's, why that's so important on nine principles of war that I want to introduce. And these are nine principles of war that I've come up with that, for me, explain um, how you can understand the intersection of storytelling and its power in warfare. Because as an Army officer, I always felt that um, the, the army didn't train enough for the power of storytelling. We were always very focused on the mechanics of how to use our weapon systems and, and how to be really good at what we were trained to do, which is fine, that was our job. Uh, but one of the things that I think that war theorists, from politicians all the way down to generals to, to, to regular soldiers on the ground, uh, don't quite um, fully appreciate, and I hope that some of my former colleagues in the United States Army or officers from all over the world will, will, will watch this, this series and, and understand uh, some of these principles and be able to apply it uh, to their application training for and hopefully never having to use um, uh, these skills in warfare. But if they do, um, this is very powerful. And then finally, after going through the nine principles of war, uh, I wanna talk about so what? What do we do with this war that we're all experiencing in Ukraine outside of Ukraine, whether Ukrainian or not, if you're watching this series, you're part of this story, whether you know it or not. And that's something I wanna uh, share with everyone who's, who's following this and cares about this story, uh, is how everyone's a part of this in their own way. And uh, the future of Ukraine's history. Because the big idea I want everyone to get from this, and this is the reason why I'm teaching this course, this is the reason why I founded a nonprofit based on the, the war in Ukraine, supporting the story around this war, is that more important than the war itself, the story that's told from this war uh, is gonna have a much greater impact. It's gonna ripple throughout history uh, far more than actually what's happened. The stories that the people who were in this war in any capacity, whether you're living through it as a student, uh, you're volunteering as a civilian, you're on the front lines as a soldier, you're watching outside of the country as a displaced person or refugee, or you're just a concerned citizen of the world, the story that, about what happened here is gonna have a far bigger impact, not just on Ukrainian history, but world history, um, because of how we tell that. And understanding that principle now, and how important that is now, will affect the quality of the, the truth of the power of that story uh, for not just our generation, but generations to come. And that's really 
uh, what I want everyone to understand watching this talk is, is how important the, the history and the story will, will be in the future compared to actually what's happened. Okay, we're all gonna die. Maybe not in this war, but we're all gonna die and pass on one of these days. And what we've experienced and seen will only live through the story that we tell. And the, what we've experienced and felt and seen will only live through the story that future generations understand from this war. And we have a unique opportunity compared to ancient historians who just were able to leave scraps of paper. We can leave so much more for future generations. We can use video, we can leave videos, we can, we can leave so many different things because of the power of modern media, multimedia, which should be very interesting to all of you as journalism students, um, and the power that we have to shape the narrative and, and shape history through the story that we tell around this war uh, is really the important thing that I want us all to leave, not just this talk with, but, but all the talks that I give throughout this course and beyond um, in the Borderlands Foundation that we've created, I wanna make sure we do. So um, there's an old saying that, that history is written by the victors. And I would like to share with you a story that, that I think updates that saying, which is history is written by the victors before it's ever written. And uh, the principle behind this story um, is this is a man named Colonel H.R. McMaster at the time. You can see him. This is in 2006 in Fort Carson, Colorado. And this was all the officers got together after our deployment to Iraq. And the purpose of this session that we were in was it was called an after action review. And this is where he brought all the officers together and he, he said, what are the lessons that we've learned from one year that we just spent in combat in Iraq. And the reason why this was so important was Colonel McMaster was a history teacher. He was a legendary history teacher in the United States Army. He, he wrote a book, a best-selling book on the lies that led to the Vietnam War and why we lost the, the Vietnam War as an American country, not just as a military, but as a country. While he was an active officer, he wrote a book about the lies that led to Vietnam. It was called Dereliction of Duty uh, Lyndon Johnson, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the, the lies that led to the Vietnam War. And he was basically criticizing everyone in the military establishment, all the way up to the president and civilian decision makers, about how they got that wrong war, that, that war wrong. And that's not a very smart thing to do as an officer, because even after these generals retire, they always stay around. They're called graybeards. They sit, hang around in Washington, D.C. They get on television. They write books. They mentor the current crop of general officers. Uh, so, so he was kind of not afraid to uh, kick over the establishment and, and talk truth to power. But General McMaster, at the time, Colonel McMaster, was the regimental commander in the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment, which was uh, the, the unit I was in that deployed to Iraq. And at that time in 2005 and 6. We were actually, I, I hate to say this because it's, it's an imperfect analogy, but we were a, a lot like, not the Ukrainian army, but we were a lot like the Russian army uh, in the current conflict because we'd invaded a country and we were having a really hard time holding on to um, and securing that country after, now there's so many things that are different. We didn't want to stay there. We've, we've basically left, handed back the country to the Iraqi people, but, the war was not going well, okay? We were having a really hard time holding on to control of the country. And what had been a three-week campaign that was very successful, very quick in terms of toppling the regime, Saddam Hussein was not a popular person in his own country. People really didn't, weren't willing to fight and die for his regime. Um, but that was the easy part. The invasion turned out to be much easier than securing the peace afterwards. And uh, Colonel McMaster was the regimental commander, and I was a, a young captain at the time, and I had the privilege or the curse, depending on how you look at it, of being his adjutant. So I had to basically follow him around and um, you know, uh, schedule his helicopter flights all around the battlefields, get, you know, get, get with him in his armor patrols through, through the, the, the city of Talafar, combat patrols that he went on as a colonel, go to all of his meetings, take notes, 
make sure he was on time, which he never was. Uh, that I didn't help the matter any because I don't really like to be on time myself, but my job was to make him on time. And I had this kind of catbird seat to history where I got to see a legendary commander who had already won a Silver Star in the Gulf War by uh, destroying a, a regiment's worth of Iraqi army, uh, you know, a Republican Guard. I think it was, um, you know, a couple thousand soldiers, his unit of 120 people defeated with no casualties in a 25 minute battle. And he was, he was already a legendary commander. And what he did in Iraq was he took, um, he took the Third Armored Cavalry Regiment, which had almost 5,000 soldiers uh, and about 20, 25,000 Iraqi soldiers, police uh, in, in northern, northwestern Iraq. And he took one of the hardest areas that, that was having a huge insurgency, and he managed to launch a huge offensive, pacify that area, and really create the first successful counterinsurgency campaign that, that worked and lasted in, 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 the, in the campaign to secure Iraq. Where, and, where was that again? In Talafar, in 2005 and six, And General McMaster had, at the time, Colonel McMaster, he had become uh, a legendary commander just by the fact of what he'd done. And as the adjutant, what I had this really amazing um, perception watching him as a historian, as a person, was he would sit in meeting after meeting with the Iraqi army, with the local sheikhs, with the police, and the war was not going well, but he started to say, this is what's gonna happen, okay? He, t he tuned into the Iraqi population's discontent, and instead of saying, hey, we've done everything perfectly, you guys should be loving us because we freed you from Saddam Hussein, he listened, and he listened to the population, and he said, you know what, I hear you. The American army made a lot of mistakes when we came into Iraq, okay? We didn't secure the, the critical infrastructure. We fired the Iraqi army. Uh, we, we, we embarrassed, humiliated a lot of people uh, who were part of the security services. We did not do this right, okay? And he was really the first American officer at a very high level to sit down, listen to the population, level with them and tell them, I hear you and, you know, I'm gonna apologize on behalf of my government for the mistakes that we've made, but here's the deal. Uh, right now, we're having a huge amount of insurgency. The Islamic State, which was radical Islamist, uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and the Islamic State was just getting started at that point. They were creating suicide car bombs. Marketplaces were no longer safe to go shopping in. Uh, families were afraid to send their children to school, afraid to go out because they didn't want to be caught in a violent crossfire between the insurgents and the American soldiers and the new Iraqi army and police, which were targets. And what he realized as a commander, who was a great warfighter, who loved to fight, who loved to you know, shoot big, big weapons and, and conduct massive campaigns of you know, armored violence, because that, that's what he'd been trained to do, but he was able to, to understand that the center of gravity in this war and, and in all wars is not what army wins, but is what army inspires the, the people that they're fighting on that land to support them. And he understood that as much as he wanted to go out and solve a lot of problems by fighting and killing our enemy, that we couldn't kill everyone that was against us we had to inspire the Iraqi population to get onto our side and secure their own country, which he said, hey, you need to step up and help your own government secure your own country, and then we'll leave. But we want to leave you better off than we found you. Right now, the situation's worse, um, and we need your help to take control of your own country. Then we're going to leave this country. And he relentlessly refined and gave that message, and much more than even the violent events that happened, and there were plenty of them, Navy, Navy SEALs were in the town, snipers running all over the place, uh, rangers coming in, helicopter gunships, lots of fighting was happening. But the most important thing that I saw was he was able to tell the population, this is the story that's gonna happen, okay? We've made mistakes, this is the story that's happened, let's be honest about it. 
but this is what's going to happen. You're going to step up, you're going to secure your country, and we're going to leave. And only when you've done that uh, will you get your country back. And Iraq, fast forward to 2020, they've had a lot of ups and downs, but my interpreter who used to live there uh, and now lives in the United States but travels back regularly, he said, you know, things are, are going really well economically and, and you know, we've basically, it's a messy democracy, but we've, we've, you know, we feel better than we've ever felt. That's 2022. That took 20 years after the invasion, right? But um, what, what that taught me watching this was great leaders, and this, this happens in politics. You guys know this with, with uh, President Zelensky, servant of the people. He makes a TV show about becoming president, and then he becomes president based on the TV show. Great leaders tell a story before it ever happens, and they make it so. And that one principle of storytelling being someone who can tap into the story that everyone's feeling right now and then tell the future as it needs to be uh, is the most powerful weapon in human history ever created. Okay, and you can apply that weapon with your children. You can apply that we weapon with your, and I say weapon, not with your children in, in that way, but, but this, this powerful tool of storytelling can, can work on any relationship, but all the way up to war, wars between societies, is understanding and really connecting with where people are and how they feel, and then helping them tell the story of a better future. That's what politicians do to get elected. That's what leaders do to win wars. Uh, and that's really the foundation of the power of war and, and the power of storytelling in war that I, I think covers everything that happens in war, starts with that principle. Um, so war is a battle of stories. And my favorite historical figure growing up, I was, uh, was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland. My father is English. And I grew up to stories of World War II history. Okay, and I, I grew up to stories of the Battle of Britain. And I, I read the six volume history that Churchill wrote of, of World War II and recently just finished uh, William Ch Manchester's uh, biography on him. And think about Winston Churchill in 1940 after France fell to Germany. Americans aren't coming into the war. France, their biggest ally, has just fallen. Germany basically controls the continent. They've just conquered Norway. Hitler and Stalin are best friends. In fact, Stalin's shipping just tons of oil and, and food from Ukraine and oil from the Caucasus that's, that's fueling the German war machine. And hit, you know, Winston Churchill, literally the only weapon he had was his ability to write speeches and get on radio and basically convince the British, not just the British people, uh, but the Americans who were supporting the British, that, that all hope was not lost. And the power of his ability until the Soviet Union was invaded, Ukraine, and we'll get to that in a moment, the Soviet Union was invaded and Britain was basically fighting alone for one year. That's all, that's all that he had really at his disposal while the entire British army had just evacuated from France at Dunkirk, left all of their equipment. Things were looking pretty bleak and Winston Churchill uh, as, as famously said, John F. Kennedy, I think, paraphrased what, what one of the commenters, uh, media commenters said at the time was he mobilized the English language and sent it into battle. Okay, And war is a battle of stories. And Winston Churchill had this amazing ability for all of the allies because it brought the Americans into the war, um, even managed to create an alliance, a very interesting alliance with the Soviet Union, uh, the Americans and the British, uh, was fighting um, what, what I think we can all look back on and agree was not the best outcome for human humanity if Hitler would have won, won the Second World War. Now, it was an imperfect victory because a lot of you who lived under Soviet uh, domination in, in Central and Eastern Europe after the war, that wasn't a great result either for a lot of people, but, but eventually the Cold War ended and the, the, the Warsaw Bloc f fell, and, and Ukraine and a lot of ex-Soviet republics now have gained their independence. But we're still living through the after effects of that, even to this day, as we all 
see through the war. Now this, this picture I brought up for a very specific reason. This was filmed in Zaporizhia on, on 10 March, 1943. It was Hitler's, one of his last visits to the front lines. He was just, I think, 40 kilometers away from the front lines in uh, Ukraine at the time. He was, he was visiting General Erich von Manstein, uh, who was the uh, German commander of, of the forces in Ukraine. And, and Erich von Manstein is a very interesting figure because as a US Army officer, I remember studying him uh, as a cadet because we, we actually took a, a trip to France in 1940 with uh, our professors for 10 days to study the German invasion of France in 1940. And the American army, um, when I was growing up in it, had this extreme fascination and almost hero worship of the uh, proficiency of the German army in World War II. Because the German army in World War II was pretty, pretty amazing at fighting, okay? And, and there's just, there's no way to deny uh, some of their battlefield exploits, especially in the early parts of the war, were, were amazing military history achievements that deserve to be studied. Um, but I, I remember as a professor, when I went to go back and teach at West Point, Adam Tews, his famous economic historian, military historian, came to talk to the faculty at West Point, and he confronted us. It was very interesting. He said, you know, this fascination and this worship of German military tactics, do you know where this comes from? Well, during the Cold War, when the Soviet army was, was in East Germany and we were deathly afraid, especially after Vietnam when we lost, that the Soviet tanks were gonna roll through uh, Germany and, and go to France and, and basically take over Western Europe, American, the American army after the Vietnam War had just lost uh, this war, they went to the German, off they sat down with General Manstein, who's a very old man at this point, and they said, teach us please how to beat the Soviets, right? You wrote the book, and I mean, you had this amazing series of victories. Uh, he, he wrote a book called Lost Victories about his amazing series of victories against the Soviet army in Ukraine, both going through Ukraine on the offensive and uh, fighting against tremendous odds, the Soviet army that was sweeping back through Ukraine in 1943. The battles down at the Azov. You guys think the Battle of Mariupol is the first time that's happened? No. Okay, during the Battle of Azov, the battles of Crimea, uh, during the Second World War, the exact same battles happened. Okay, even the Battle of Izum in Kharkiv, the same operational plan the Ukrainian army just executed that was executed in 1942, uh, which surrounded uh, an entire uh, four Soviet armies in, in the Izum area, okay? History, especially in Ukraine, there's a huge shadow looming over Ukraine. And we're, we're gonna talk about World War II and what that means to Ukraine and to the world. Because if you think about the storytelling around this war, what is it all going back to? We're fighting Nazis, okay? That's what, that's what Putin, that's how he's mobilizing the Russian population. We're just going to kill Nazis. It's the same thing. They're just, they're, they're manned by the American army, which, you know, is just a descendant of the Nazis, according to Putin, okay? And, and there's some truth to that. American tactics, which are very maneuver-oriented, they, they got all of that from learning from the German generals in, in uh, the 1970s and 80s, and that was bred into the officer corps, and that was taught. We would visit the battlefields of France and, and follow the, the great campaigns of the German army in 1940, France fell in six weeks when in four years in World War I, they didn't conquer France. Uh, so there's some truth to some of these stories that are out there, right? Which is the Western military establishment became enamored of and fascinated by the German army. But here's the one thing that Tu said in, the, in, the, in this meeting that we'll, I'll never forget is he said, I remember we were talking about the Fulda Gap and how the Soviets were gonna come in and we were talking about this idea of deep battle and letting the enemy come in so you can surround them. And then we all looked around and, and some of the American officers said, well, okay, well, we're gonna let the Soviet army get all the way to, to Luxembourg and, and down into Southern France. There's 80 million people. What's gonna to happen to them? And, and Monstein and all these 
officers just said, well, that's war. So the, the German army, which was so good at fighting, they didn't care about what happened to the civilian population. And, and in Ukraine, you know that. You know that better than anyone from the history was people in World War II in the way of the German, these titanic clashes that had great maneuver warfare, people didn't matter, right? And, and one of the main reasons, and I'm gonna to talk to you about this through this talk, why did the German army lose when they were man for man the best army of World War II? And, and they, they outfought consistently. They inflicted way more casualties on the Americans than the Americans have inflicted on them. And we'll talk about what they did with the Red Army in the beginning of the campaign. But ultimately, they lost. Now, there's this joke that the victors write history, and I say, well, the History Channel didn't get the memo because Nazis keep the History Channel in business, right? Nazis and American Confederate Army is like, that's, that's what the American History Channel is built on. But the reason his, Hitler lost, and I'm gonna argue through this talk, is, is because he got the story wrong. And that is something that you need to understand. So who am I and why am I up here talking about storytelling? Um, that's me right before I left the army in 2013. Uh, I, my last five years uh, teaching, my last five years in the army I spent as a professor of uh, Russian history at West Point, the United States Military Academy at West Point. Last three years I taught uh, freshmen who were 18, 19 years old, uh, new cadets uh, or freshman cadets in their first year, uh, European history the first semester and then Russian history the second semester. And two years before that, I spent studying Russian history at NYU under the, the greatest Russian scholars in the American uh, academic system, Richard Wartman, Jane Burbank, uh, Yanni Katsonis, all these great intellectuals who, who've studied um, Russian history. And, and at that point in 2008 to 10, when I went to grad school, studying Russian history wasn't very cool because everyone was studying Arabic, you know, war on terror, Islamic history, getting ready for the fight with China. Uh, everyone just forgot about Russia. They said, oh, it's Cold War's over, right? But, but Vladimir Putin didn't seem to uh, get the memo. Um, I left the army in 2013, and I, I did a very interesting career move where it didn't make a lot of sense to anyone at the time, including myself, but I didn't want to stay in the army, and I went into digital marketing. I became a media uh, media agency owner, uh, traveled the world for a year. Um, actually, during the time I was traveling the world, the Maidan revolution uh, started. Uh, I remember sitting in a cafe in, in Stockholm, Sweden, watching uh, the first protests happen and, and, and following that very incessantly because when I was teaching Russian history at West Point, my specialty was Ukrainian history. In fact, my thesis was on Catherine the Great and uh, her conquest of southern Ukraine uh, and Crimea, and my wife's now named Katerina. So um, perfect uh, symmetry there. And I, I was studying um, Ukrainian history as my main focus, and I was fascinated by, and I'd met a bunch of Ukrainians while I was living in New York City, um, and met some people even from Crimea, and I was fascinated by and had friends from uh, Ukraine and what was happening at that time. People from Belarus, people from Russia, Ukraine. I, I was friends with all of them. And when this started, this started all in 2014, uh, I was following it very closely. Then I ended up moving to Poland. Uh, I started teaching a course on storytelling. I think we've sold 15 or 20,000 uh, copies of this course online that we've called Story Matters, uh, Storytelling in the Digital Age, and became a kind of a storytelling expert, and I was teaching business owners how to use storytelling to grow their business, and that's what I, I've been doing for the last uh, 10 plus years since I left, uh, or eight or nine years since I left the United States Army, is running a media company, uh, building technology, and, and teaching storytelling. So I've found a way uh, with this course uh, to, to start uh, combining um, storytelling and war. And uh, one of the things, I'm gonna to get to this uh, later, um, there's basically, so, so now let's move into the nine principles of war. And when I talk about the nine principles of war, um, I wanna 
do a couple of things. I want to explore the historical analogies because the history of World War II is still impacting this war. The, the narrative of World War II is, is rich in, in the, uh, the mobilization, the stories of this war, uh, the, the lessons, the, the tactical plans that people are still using, or they're basically rerunning battles from World War II. Uh, but more importantly, war, the greatest teacher is history, and it's not that history repeats itself, it, it rhymes, it, it always comes up in different ways, but, but a lot of the trends are just embedded uh, in the geography, the culture, the narratives that, that stay with us throughout history. And um, I'm going to talk about the first three levels of war, and I, I call this actually uh, information. Um, the story, storytelling part of war, which most military uh, historians go straight into, um, they go straight into you know, offensive operations, raids, they go into the, the kinetic part of warfare, the fighting. But really, the most important part is actually starts with the storytelling. And that's the first principle, and that's why it's number one, which is if, if you get storytelling right, Everything else is just a matter of time, in my perspective. Now, stories can rise and fall. So someone can have a more powerful story at the beginning of a war and lose because their story deteriorates. Uh, it gets worse. Uh, but, but ultimately, uh, if you get the story right, uh, you're going to win the war. It's just a question of time. Just, it's just a question of how painful, what the cost is going to be. And I illustrate this point by putting up there the two grand protagonists of, of the Second World War from Ukraine's perspective, which is Joseph Stalin and uh, Adolf Hitler. And Stalin was not a popular guy in Ukraine. I don't have to, I think, uh, tell any of you that something you don't know. In 1939, when Hitler and Stalin made their alliance of convenience to carve up what's left of what was left of Poland at the time, and, and uh, basically wiped Poland off the map. Uh, Ukraine had just finished about, if you've read Tim Timothy Snyder's famous book called Bloodlands, uh, you can get very deep, uh, rich history about this, but um, Stalin killed anywhere between three and five million Ukrainians in the Holodomor, uh, the Great Famine uh, of, of 1932 and 1933. Uh, he, he targeted specifically the intelligentsia of Ukraine um, and a bunch of different ethnic minorities that lived in Ukraine, Poles, Ukrainians, uh, Germans, any uh, perceived enemies of the state, uh, Tartars, they were all rounded up and executed. Of a couple million people were killed in Ukraine by Stalin um, during, during the 1930s. So, Stalin was not a popular figure in Ukraine, and when Hitler invaded in 1941, um, everyone likes to look back in history and say, of course it was never going to work. Okay? Of course Operation Barbarossa was doomed to failure. But from the German perspective, that's not true, because in 1918, the German army controlled Ukraine completely at the end of World War I. Ukraine was given by the Bolsheviks in a peace treaty to Germany, as well as Belarus and the Baltic states. So from the German perspective, we've, we've beaten Russia before, okay? We're just gonna go back and do what we did in 1918, but this time we just wiped France off the face of the battlefield, the, the, the map, basically. We don't have a two-front war like we did in 1918. France is completely subjugated. Britain's, this guy's making speeches on the radio, who cares, okay? We should be able to make short work of, of Russia, of the Soviet Union, and look at Stalin. This guy, he's not really popular, is he? I mean, do you really think the Ukrainians are gonna stand up and fight for this guy? Do you think the Belarusians are gonna stand up and fight for this guy? That actually was a very, very, lucrative opportunity for Hitler was if he just would have come into Ukraine and said, hey, I'm like the Americans tried to say in Iraq and the Iraqis really didn't fight that hard for Saddam. We're just liberating you from this evil dictator. 
um, and acted accordingly, not just said it, but acted accordingly, history could have turned out very differently. But that's not the way the German army beha behaved when they came into Ukraine. And we all know that. And we'll talk about um, the history of, of the German army's treatment of Ukraine. And fundamentally, Hitler couldn't do that because his story on which he got elected, which made him so powerful inside of Germany, didn't allow him to treat Ukrainians. Ukrainians were Slavic, Untermenschen. Ukraine was all about living space. There was a whole plan which was developed in detail by the general staff to not just kill all of the Jews, but to depopulate Ukraine and resettle it with German farmers and, and army officers who'd, who'd served their time in the Wehrmacht because Germany needed living room. So Hitler's story didn't allow him to do the thing that if he would have done it, if he would have come in and just behaved a little bit better than Stalin, the war could have turned out very differently. And that story is what cost Germany the war. And we're gonna talk about, when I introduce each one of the sets of principles, I, I introduce them in threes, I'm gonna go back to history just to remind you about the historical precedents and examples of the things that we're talking about as we explore the current war. So there's three principles Storytelling first, and then I'm gonna go in as a, as a marketing agency owner. I'm gonna bring marketing and business terms uh, into military uh, warfare theory because I wanna ex explain to you why these are the most important things. And story or information at, the, at, the, at its heart, the reason these three principles are so important is information is what wins or loses the local population, all right? And any military, that fails to win over a local population is, is destined to lose. And I think everyone understood before the war, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more at the end of this, everyone understood at the beginning of this war that Russia was doomed to failure in Ukraine long term, but no one, no one imagined the war would turn out the way it's turning out right now because of different expectations and assumptions about uh, what was gonna happen. But ultimately, the reason Stalin won, with a lot of help from other allies, is he just had a little bit better or less evil story than Hitler, okay? And it's not, it's not that hard to outdo Stalin on storytelling, but Hitler managed to really mess it up, right? for the Ukrainians and, and for the, the Belarusians. So let's look at President Zelensky and President Putin. That, that picture of President Zelensky at the podium, as, as you know, he no longer wears suits. It's all green, tan, camouflage, um, and that in itself tells a huge story. And then President Putin, this is the day he announced that he was going uh, to uh, invade Ukraine or a special military operation, as he called it. and. Both of them have very different stories about why they're going to war. And both of them are getting a fair amount of success with their population with that story, okay? But the difference between Russians being willing to die for their story versus maybe support it by watching on television is very different than Ukrainians. And, and we all know as, as the war has, has progressed, Ukraine doesn't have a problem with getting people to volunteer for the military. They don't have a problem with people trying to dodge conscription efforts. And Russia, more people have left Russia since mobilization was announced than invaded Ukraine. So they've, they've, they've actually lost more people than they've probably lost on the battlefield to just fleeing the country. And the story of President Putin First of all, you have, to, you have to treat it with respect as someone who obviously doesn't believe in it and understand where does this come from and how can he still be in power, which I think is quite an achievement, with the way the war's been going so badly. And it's because he has a story that's not working that well on the battlefield, but it's working well enough to keep him in power and keep him in the war. And if Ukrainians do not respect and understand and have a little bit of empathy for that story and where it's coming from, you run the risk of doing what President Putin did, which was completely underestimating and losing to your enemy because you get the story wrong. 
Just because Ukraine's winning the storytelling narrative right now doesn't mean that can't change. And you can bet that President Putin is trying to do everything that he can to change the narrative of the story. The only time the Russian military has ever really won is when a leader manages to convince their people that they are truly under an existential threat. And this isn't just some military adventure you know, for the glory of, of, the, of the leader. That, that changes everything in Russia. And Putin is trying as hard as he can, if you watch state media, to paint this as a war against the West and, and as an invasion of the Nazis. And, and the Americans are just you know, in, inheritors of the Nazi tradition. I mean, their military has studied all of their stuff and, and, and they, they use the same tactics and the same terminology and they have the same ideology, right? They're fascists. And Ukrainians are just puppet, puppets of Nazis from the West who, who just infest the West. And if we don't understand that and have empathy for that and understand that that's what we're up against as a story and fight against that constantly in Ukraine and, and across the West, we could fall victim to what happened to President Putin, which is he completely dismissed out of hand the story that Ukraine has. And Ukraine's story is we are free people. We've always been free. That's our freedom is our religion. And we are willing to fight and die for our freedom. And that's a very simple but powerful story that President Putin just refused to believe. And if you read his essay on, on the Kremlin's website from June of 2022, he talks about on the historical unity of Russian and Ukrainian people. He wasn't just writing that for his health. Like Hitler wasn't just writing Mein Kampf, you know, for, to become a best-selling author. That's what he believed. And if you've listened to President Putin's speeches over the last several years, he said to President Bush in 2007 at the NATO summit, Ukraine isn't a real state. His ideas and his story that he's telling himself and has told his country about Ukraine are not new. But they're the reason why Russia at this point is losing the war. But we, we should be very careful to dismiss the reason why Russia is still able to stay in the war. And, and how that story that they're trying to bring up and they're trying to, to spin up and, and the greatest gift that President Putin could ever get would be, it, from his perspective, and a lot of people in his corner think that if we could just get the West to come in and threaten us and really become involved in this war, or our people feel like they're really involved in this war, then that changes everything, right? We're, we're going to fight to the death. We know how to do that. We did it in 1941 40 to 45. We did that in the War of 1812. If we can just get that back then we, we can win this, right? So um, this battle of stories between these two presidents, and this, it's fascinating, they both have the same name after the founder of you know, Christendom in, in Ukraine, Volodymyr or Vladimir. Um, it's a fascinating uh, historical irony of you know, this one name and two different pronunciations of the same name and different heritages and different, very different stories about what Ukraine and Kiev and Ukraine's rich history, which is older than Russia's and Moscow's, means. And who owns it, right? Who, who, who gets to actually use that history uh, for their own national narrative? So in the, in the storytelling class, we're gonna really dive deep into, and I'm gonna ask all of you to consider both sides, because if you don't study both sides and you just, Congratulate yourself on how well you're doing on your own side in Ukraine. You, you, you run the very real risk of making the same mistakes that Russia's done. So, so we're going to go into both sides in the story. Um, the second principle I'd like to emphasize is right below storytelling is marketing. And marketing is basically using mass media to get the message out there, using social media, using television appearances, using newspapers, influencing the media. And what's amazing about this war is nobody thought, I think, President Zelensky was the best potential wartime leader that Ukraine ever could have elected. Uh, and I don't think he's done everything perfectly at all. There's a lot of things that President Zelensky could do better. And if he's honest and he's a good politician, he, know, he understands that and, and he's, he's working on those things. But I think one of the things that 
we all need to uh, recognize is that um, comedians actually kind of a funny profession because you kind of think it's a joke of a profession, but actually Joe Rogan, who runs one of the most popular podcasts in the world, actually I think the most popular podcast in the world, he's a comedian, and he talks about how hard it is to be a successful stand-up comedian and how few really good stand-up comedians there are in the world because it's so hard to get it right. And if you look at President Zelensky and all of his background in, in, in entertainment, um, the ultimate form of communication and storytelling is actually humor because it's the hardest thing to get right and pull off. Uh, and that's why being a comedian is, is so hard and also they get so much reward for it in terms of you know, financial reward. And uh, what President Zelensky has been able to do once the war started, and I, I'm gonna go through this in our Principles of Storytelling lecture next week, is he's played the part perfectly of convincing the world that he's not provoking a war. Okay, he, there's no way that anyone could accuse him of wanting to have this war started. He was at the Munich conference right before the war started, begging Putin to sit down with him and negotiate, right? Which, which can upset some people in Ukraine who are like, you know, we, we just need to fight this guys if they're gonna come fight. But he was begging. Putin, let's sit down, let's sit down, let's talk, let's talk. Even when the war started, hey, we're still ready to talk. We're having talks, we're ready to not join NATO, and now we've applied for NATO membership. But I remember watching the war, and I actually uh, interviewed Sergei, I think one of the first days of the war on our initial broadcast for Borderlands, and the moment where the first night of the war I was speaking to Alex, I'd left Ukraine, I'd gotten my media company out of Ukraine, but I was speaking to Alex, who was still in Ukraine, who was running my, my tech company. And he said, Sam, and he's very well connected. He knows a lot of people in high places and oligarchs. He said, I think, I think the government might change tonight. You know, I think this, this thing could be over pretty soon. You know, it sounds like the government's getting wobbly and some of them, it's rumored they're fleeing and this could be over pretty soon. And I remember the next day when President Zelensky posted this video, I shared it on my Facebook feed. He said, hey, we're all here, right? And it's pretty hard to fake a selfie video out there in, in the center of Kiev. You know, Reznikov and his chief of staff and, and his minister, they're, they're all standing there saying, hey, we're here. Actually, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs was flying back from the US at that point. Um, and that was, I remember that was electrifying. And also the famous quote that came out, whether he said it on the call exactly that way or not, it doesn't matter. He said, the fight is here. I need ammunition, not a ride. That just took off across social media. This, this video, I think, was set to rap music and had, I don't know how many millions of views across the West. You know, you had pictures of Vitaly and Vladimir Klitschko, you know, manning machine guns on the gates of Kiev. And who knows what, what this, if, how much of this is real and how much of this is staged, but it doesn't matter because the story is what matters. Whether President Zelensky was crying in the basement for 23 hours and came out and did that, whatever happened, it doesn't matter. Because the perception across the world was, here's this poor, weak, not wanting to fight peace candidate, you know, Jewish comedian in Ukraine, who's out there making selfie videos saying, hey, we're here and we're ready to fight. It was like this complete metamorphosis where no one could accuse the guy of trying to start the war, begging for it to not start, but then when it starts, let's go, <laughs> all right? And that story, uh, in my view, um, made all the difference in terms of people's willingness to go out and fight. And I always knew from talking to my Ukrainian friends that there was gonna be a long insurgency. And, and actually, Sergei was saying on the second, third day of war, hey, we've been preparing for this for eight years, we're ready to fight for the next 10, 15, 20 years. But I don't think anyone expected the military and you know, the Russian military outnumbered the Ukrainian military 12 to one outside of Kiev. But what they didn't expect was thousands of people just grabbing weapons, running out there. And how much this helped, I don't know, but it certainly didn't hurt. And if your president flees to Western Ukraine or leaves the country, 
it's a lot harder to say, hey, I'm ready to die for this country and that story. Um, and, and I remember watching from outside the, the, the feeling this created and the shame it created among European leaders who've been holding back on sending helmets and medical supplies. Now all of a sudden Germany sending tanks and not tanks, but anti-aircraft, you know, tracked anti-aircraft weapons, you know, artillery, howitzer systems. It, it absolutely changed the dynamic of the war. The, the international support for Ukraine, I don't think any of us could have predicted the amount of weapons, the amount of support, the amount of financial support, the sanctions against Russia. Is it enough against Russia? Probably not. But President Biden is very sensitive to playing into the Russian story of the West versus Russia. And I think for good reason. There's, there's reasons why America is being cautious in its, in its support. Um, whether it's the right move or wrong move, there's a reason for it from a storytelling perspective. But President Zelensky, with his theatric, his flair for, for um, the camera, the guy's never met a camera I'm sure he doesn't like, right? An audience that he won't perform for. He's in the perfect role. And a lot of people have criticized President Zelensky. Why are you just doing speeches and, and videos and all that? Why aren't you, your generals are doing fine. Like stop messing with your generals, keep talking, right? You know, you're great at this stuff. Keep doing that marketing. And, and, and Ukraine is lucky to have someone who's, who's so good at marketing and so good at storytelling on camera. Uh, I think that's been, you know, every single day of the war, he's given a, he's given a talk whether it's him sitting bleary eyed at 3 a.m. in front of a phone selfie video or he's doing high production quality, he's talking to the people every day. And, and you all see that. You all are getting those messages and the story of the war, not just what's happening, but we're gonna win. We're gonna win. We're gonna become part of Europe. We're gonna become part of NATO. That, that's the story he's telling and he's telling it before it's happening. And I think it's, it's working, all right? Now sales is different. Um, in marketing for business and sales, marketing is what makes sales easier or even unnecessary. You, you create a bunch of marketing and ads and then people come in and they end up buying. They end up getting on the phone with someone and making a purchasing decision or they go to a shopping cart and then they end up buying something. Um, but in, in, in the military perspective, sales, in my view, is actually, um, what soldiers do on the battlefield in relation to the population, okay? And I remember in Iraq when we used to go into a house, I would tell my soldiers, I'd say, you, you need to remember that these, these Iraqis, you know, yeah, we're going in to look for some people who, who may or may not be there, who are bad, but our intelligence isn't always perfect and you need to understand that this family and the, those little kids, which in five years could be fighting you, this is their one and probably owner, only interaction they're ever gonna have with American soldiers. And you can absolutely shock them into a brand new perspective on who American soldiers really are versus the cartoon figures that they've been told. And when you look at pictures at the beginning of the war that made it out on Twitter of Ukrainians standing in front of Russian tanks and Russians not shooting them, just like completely blown away. Like, why aren't you welcoming us as liberators, right? The, that interaction between the population and the soldiers is so, is so important to warfare. And Russians, not all of them are evil and, and want to kill everyone. A lot of them have, have done some horrible things in Ukraine, but a lot of them are human beings who are caught up in this, this huge thing that they don't want to be caught up in. And that interaction with humans, with, between the people and the soldiers on the battlefield, ultimately creates um, the outcome of the war. And how soldiers treat the civilian population, they either get them on the side or, or they don't. And there's different ways to get people on your side. One method is to kill a lot of people so that people are scared and they don't, they don't misbehave, right? That's one tactic. The other tactic is to really get people on your side by treating them well with respect. And that's very hard because when there's 2% of the population trying to kill you and the, the you know, 90% are just trying to stay out of the way, um, you can make mistakes. And we did that in Iraq a lot of times. We, we would upset parts of the population by going after the, the really bad people. And they knew 
that their strength was to hide among it. And, and Sergey, who's, who's with us here, um, you know, who works with people who, you know, uh, who are out there in the population, the, the Ukrainian resistance movement behind the enemy lines right now is, is substantial because the Russians have not managed to win over the population, right? And the reason they've not managed to win over the population is because they've not been trained well in it or they're, they're not disciplined well. I mean, you're sending convicts into Ukraine. How do you think that's gonna go? <laughs> do you think that's gonna win, win hearts and minds by sending you know, serial mass murderers to lead platoons of other convicts in Ukraine? It's probably not gonna go well, okay? And, and it's gonna push more and more people into the resistance movement, whether it's overt resistance or passive helping the resistance movement. Um, that's the, the really critical part. And in this moment here, when, when this is actually a post from the Holocaust Foundation about uh, the Babin Yar Memorial, which was uh, bombed on March 1st. Okay, and on March 1st of, of 2022, uh, this, this monument to where 60,000 people were killed, massacred in Ukraine, uh, during the war, during the Second World War, um, touched a nerve. And it, it caused a huge amount of outrage in the local population, international Jewish community. And that created, and it can get amplified on social media and have a huge effect. These, these negative interactions uh, with the population, which especially get magnified. Look at what happened in Bucha. There's no possibility after Bucha and Izium that Ukrainian people now are gonna accept anything less than complete victory or eviction of Russian forces from occupied territories, including Crimea, which at the beginning of the war, I think President Zelensky thought there was a potential for some kind of negotiation there, but now there's none. And that cycle of violence between people and the local army um, can be really difficult uh, to overcome once you do that. And we experienced that in Iraq. Again, the American army was um, on the other side of this. And, and we had to, to navigate a lot of what the Russian military is uh, experiencing in Ukraine. Now, the second three principles are what I call intelligence. And there's three, three parts to intelligence, and I'll go through those, and I'll illustrate each one of those in, in, in the current war. But let's zoom back to World War II again. On 1942, June 22nd, 1941, Operation Barbarossa started. And Hitler moved three million German soldiers towards the borders of Ukraine and Belarusia and uh, towards uh, the Baltic states. And he managed to achieve uh, a huge level of surprise against the Soviet Union because he literally chose to disregard all the intelligence he was getting from the Soviet you know, the NKVD was not stupid. They had all kinds of spies across Europe. They were warning Stalin about the movement of German forces. They were warning him. There was all kinds of surveillance along the border. But Stalin just chose, because of his story that he was telling himself, that Hitler wasn't going to invade them or violate their treaty. He basically just ignored it. And in fact, the first I think 16 or 17 days of the Operation Barbarossa, Stalin was in such shock that he, he didn't even get on the radio. He, he couldn't address his people for the first two weeks of the war because he was so shocked, he was, he was so ashamed or whatever his psychological condition was over what had happened. It, it was a massive intelligence failure. And in the the first part of, of the war, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get into the last three principles, um, the, the consequences of that intelligence failure were catastrophic, for, especially for Ukraine and the, the, the Red Army in general in terms of three million casualties uh, in the very opening uh, months of the war. It was absolutely catastrophic. And, and intelligence comes from support of the population. And one of the things that the Soviet Union managed to get right in the war after the initial shock of the invasion was the partisan movement. The partisan movement in Ukraine uh, 
ended up de destroying the German army's log logistics. Uh, the farther they went into Russia, the Ukrainian resistance movement inside of Ukraine um, was based on great intelligence that the NKVD was able to, to create, uh, to create uh, probably the biggest partisan insurgent movement in, you know, in, in modern history. And what's amazing is knowing that history, President Putin assumed that Ukraine was gonna be easy, right? These guys were such good partisans in World War II. In fact, you guys didn't start, stop fighting until 1953. You didn't get the memo after the Red Army came in in 1944. It kept fighting for another eight years um, until Ukrainian insurgency, which was really probably a 25 year insurgency when you look back to Stalin's years. He was basically fighting Ukrainians for his whole rule until he died and, and Khrushchev made a little bit of peace with Ukraine. And the same story of le national leaders choosing not to believe their own intelligence agencies played out in this war. Uh, President Zelensky famously, there was, a, there was a, we'll talk about this in the intelligence, uh, Major General uh, Kirill Budinov here, the chief of uh, the Ukrainian intelligence directorate, he was the one in the military intelligence side that was saying this war is going to happen. But I think President Zelensky wanted to listen to his friend who's now fired, who's running the SBU and say, no, this, this isn't going to happen. And that was something he, he's got a lot of to answer for to civil society. There's not a lot of people in the military and in Ukraine who are not happy that President Zelensky downplayed and didn't believe the intelligence that the Americans were saying before the war. Now, the Americans don't have a great history of intelligence uh, failures ourselves. I mean, we, we got a lot wrong with Afghanistan and weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, but President Zelensky didn't want to hear the intelligence that the Americans had said. But right before the war, uh, the senior leaders of the Ukrainian government that heard General Budinov, and thankfully the military was listening to him, General Zeluzny and the officers took the war very seriously. Um, not all of them, some of them were, were more prepared than others, but overall, um, he was right about the Russian invasion. He talked, he talked about the date, he got it right, he got the date wrong, right, and he contradicted um, what was the, the political leadership in Ukraine was saying about the war. But let's look at Russia also. What did, what did Russia get wrong in the lead up to the war? Well, Putin, if you looked at how the Russian forces came into Ukraine, they basically, I think one of the reasons why the SBU didn't understand the war was gonna start or didn't wanna believe it was because the Russian soldiers didn't know the war was gonna start. They got lied to by their own leadership and if Ukraine, like they were doing their job, had spies all throughout the Russian military, they, they would have just heard what the soldiers were hearing. We're just on a training exercise in Belarus, drink it up boys. Yeah, go sell your weapons, go sell your fuel, it doesn't matter. Um, and then, whoa, we've got to go to war. And they're completely shocked by their own leadership. They were more surprised than the Ukrainians that the war was starting, the Russians. The Russian soldiers that were initially captured. And the reason why, according to American intelligence, if and we'll read this, I'll, I'll give you some articles to, to talk about this when we get to it, is the Russian leadership that planned this war believed the story they'd been told by Putin and themselves, which was Ukraine's not a real country. It's hijacked and held hostage by a Nazi regime. The people want to be liberated. The people have read my 7,000 word essay on the unity of Russia and Ukraine, and they're waiting to be liberated by us, and it's going to be easy. So we're going to march to Kiev. We're going to call ahead with dinner reservations into Khrushchev restaurants, and we're just gonna march down there and we'll, we'll be there in three days. Now, Americans never believed that Ukrainians wouldn't fight. American intelligence, people I know, none of them said Kiev was gonna fall in three days. What they said was, that's what Russia thinks. That's what Russia's plan is telling us, which is they're gonna be in Kiev in three days according to their plan. Okay, and they believe their own intelligence, they believe their own assumptions, which are based on the story. See, the this, this story drives your assumptions that drive what you believe or choose to believe from your own intelligence agencies, all the way up and down. 
And we're going to talk about this from the strategic level all the way down to the tactical level of war. And, and in the next lesson, I'll talk about different levels of war and, and how these principles go all the way down from or up from the top president, political leadership, all the way down to the soldiers on the ground. Intelligence, human intelligence is the most important type of intelligence. And thankfully, at least Ukraine's military intelligence had that right. And General Bud Budmanov's been really interesting. He gave an interview back in May when Ukraine was getting absolutely you know, hammered in the Donetsk, uh, uh, Donbass with artillery. He said, don't worry, the war's going to turn. Mid-August, late August, Russian forces are just going to start breaking. He said, by the end of the year, most of the major fighting will be done. Now, this is October 3rd, so, so we're not at the end of the year. Um, but what's interesting is how dead on all of his predictions have been. He must have some great intelligence and, and fundamentally all great intelligence satellites, all that kind of stuff we'll talk about. But fundamentally, it's the human intelligence. It's the spies. It's the understanding the, the, the motives of, of what's going on. That's, that's the most important intelligence. And we'll, we'll talk about that and, and give examples of it. Now, surveillance is next. This is Aero Rosidka, which is a, an IT army since 2014. These guys, Ukraine IT professionals, have started a nonprofit that starts, started integrating civilian technology into military operations. They've been doing it for eight years, um, but restarted right when the war started. And this is nothing new in, in warfare. We've had observation balloons, we've had aircrafts, we've had hel helicopters. Aerial surveillance has always been there, but, but drones has really just accelerated the accessibility of surveillance to people all the way up and down. Um, you know, drones are taking an outsized role because of the, the cost and the ease of employment uh, on the battlefield. And before the war, you had satellites, strategic intelligence, you had open source intelligence, which is a form of social media collective surveillance. All kinds of surveillance is now possible. It's impossible to do anything in this world now without someone picking it up. Not just military people sitting back in Washington, D.C., but some goofball, or, or, or not goofball like in a bad way, but just some hobbyist who just loves to look at satellite imagery for free and post their findings on Twitter, and that get, gets picked up, and other people comment on it. And most of the war, the reason I knew the war was coming to Ukraine, and I was telling all my team members, who none of them believed me that it was going to happen, was I was just watching all these open source intelligence analysts just say, here's the facts, here's the, the weapon systems that are on the ground, here's, here's all these social media photos of tanks right by the Ukrainian border, and they're out there not parked in, you know, they're not in tents, they're sleeping in the woods, which means I know from experience when you're sleeping in the woods, you can't do that for long, you need to start going. And that's when I knew, okay, this war is really about to start. I, I was just watching it on social media. So surveillance has taken so many forms due to social media, due to drones, due to satellites, people out there who are analyzing it and sharing it publicly um, it's really revolutionized the art of surveillance and warfare. Now, what, tor what story you believe based on that surveillance is ultimately informed by really good human intelligence. You still have to analyze it, but the amount of data that's out there now is unprecedented, and that's really revolutionized the war. In Ukraine, I believe the reason why Ukraine is winning this war is intelligence, right? And human intelligence is better. They're more in, in line with reality. They're making far better use of drones on the battlefield. And the last one, I'm gonna talk about my friend Sergey here again, is the resistance movement, okay? Reconnaissance is different than surveillance because reconnaissance is when you're willing to go put yourself out there and fight for information. And I used to do this. This was my job in the US Army. I had cavalry squad, uh, cavalry troop of 140 soldiers, and we'd send them out in small teams. And their job was to go out and sit there for two or three days, hide, observe, and pass back information. Okay. And we used to do this with sniper teams in Iraq, and we'd send them out. And most of the time, they'd never shoot at anything, but their main job was to take notes and to report and observe and, and say what what was happening. Um, but 
why is Ukraine being so successful in this war compared to Russia hitting command posts? Why have 12 Russian generals been killed? Why have every Russian ammunition depot been blown up over the last several months? It's because Ukraine, because they have a story that mobilizes enough people to risk their lives behind enemy lines that are in occupied territories that are willing to tell us where these ammunition dumps are, where these generals are, okay? And, and these fearless people who are civilians, who are volunteering, special forces teams who are going behind enemy lines, they are the ones making, these American HIMARS are not winning the war, okay? They're just a delivery system of, they're very good, but without the reconnaissance, without the ability to see what should be targeted and prioritize it, that would, that, those would be worthless systems, right? So reconnaissance is the absolute pointy end of the spear where you're willing to go put yourself at risk, whether you're a spy inside Russia or your special forces team crossing the border, going into Crimea, or you're a civilian who's in occupied Kherson, who's going out every day and taking pictures on your phone, sending them out on some cl classified whatever app that you're using, and putting yourself in danger every time you go through a checkpoint if they find any of that information. That is what's winning the war here. And see the hierarchy. Story, if you have a great story, you're gonna get people who are willing to give you great intelligence, okay? If you have a story that's completely unrealistic, you're gonna make horrible intelligence assumptions that will cost you the war, like Stalin almost did in 1941, like, Putin did at the beginning of this war, and President Zelensky to some extent, not believing his own military intelligence. That was, that was a high risk move to not get the country more ready at the beginning of the war. Thankfully, the military was ready within the boundaries it had set and was able to fight off the attack, but, but that's gonna be debated long after this war. What mistakes were made with regards to intelligence on the Ukrainian side? How do we avoid those in the future? Okay, so the last one here is operations. Now this is where everyone knows about this, the offensive, the defensive, and the raids. And these are three things that form really the foundation of winning wars. Because ultimately, until an infantry soldier goes on the ground and has control of it, you haven't, you haven't uh, secured victory. And this is General Heinz Guderian uh, outside of Kiev in the Battle of Kiev in 1941. The Battle of Kiev in 1941 was something I studied before the war as a historian. I was reading about it, reading about the huge battles of encirclement around Kiev uh, that the German army did in 1941. And what struck me about that massive operation was 600,000 Soviet soldiers were captured. Most of them didn't survive. They were either killed or died in captivity. Very few of them ended up surviving through the war uh, in captivity. In fact, Soviet soldiers from the Battle of Kiev ended up building Auschwitz and then becoming the first, um, some of the first prisoners there. And the amazing thing about the Battle of Kiev and these initial operations was the Germans killed or captured three million soldiers uh, in the opening stages of Operation Barbarossa. And why did they not win? How on earth can a society that's got a brutal, unpopular tyrant like Stalin in Ukraine and Belarus where, where he has to come through to get to, into the heart of Russia or Soviet Union, Russian part of Soviet Union, how can they, how can they inflict such massive damages in the Battle of Kiev, the Battle of Minsk and Smolensk and sur sur surround huge numbers of German sol or Soviet soldiers, kill and capture them all and not win the war when they weren't fighting a two front war like they were in World War I or two or in World War I. And it's because of Bob and Yar where on 29 and 30 September in 1940, after they captured Kiev, the Germans, round up the entire Jewish population of Kiev that's still there and kill them in two days, right? That's enough to not win over the local population. And 
That's enough to create this sense that a lot of Ukrainians have in occupied territories now after seeing Bucha, after seeing Irpin, after seeing what they're seeing around them. Well, I might as well go down fighting. Because if that's, if that's what's waiting for us, let's just, <laughs> let's make it fun. Okay? And that's what's going on in, in, in Ukraine right now. The untold story, which we're not going to be able to tell until after the war, after these territories are liberated, is why do you think the Russians can't fight effectively? Because they have to control massive lines of communication where the population hates them. They have to play policeman and soldier. And I've done that in Iraq, and it's not, it's not fun. So these three operations, you have the offensive big operation, like the, the Battle of Kiev and, and these big operations, Stalingrad being the classic, iconic defensive operation of World War II, which is probably a lot like the Battle of Mariupol in terms of you know, the fact that it created this huge legend uh, within both militaries that, that still, I think to this day, rallies you know, the Soviet uh, descendants, the Russian army and, and the Ukrainian army. What happened in Mariupol and the, the legendary defense of that garrison, which we'll talk about, you know, is going to create myths that will power you know, a new national history for not just the military, but, but the whole country. And then finally, raids are attacks point attacks in, in territories uh, that you may or may not control uh, completely behind enemy lines or in your own territories. In Iraq, we theoretically control a lot of areas. We'd have to do raids to, to clean out people who are fighting against us. That's what the Russians are having to do or try to do uh, to counter insurgents in, in Ukraine. And they can also be air raids. They can be strategic attacks, missile attacks, on targets of, of strategic significance. But uh, if you think about raids in, in the World War II perspective, every single day German military was, was suffering raids behind enemy lines or behind their friendly lines in Ukraine from the partisan movement. I mean, they, they had uh, trains being blown up all the time, ambushes happening all the time, raids by, by groups of insurgents from the Ukrainian, different insurgent armies inside of Ukraine. That takes a huge toll. And the, the game of cat and mouse where you're getting raided and you're raiding someone else in the territory you think you control is absolutely what bled the German military dry in, in World War II was the amount of troops they had to commit to securing their rear areas on the Eastern Front and the amount of troops they lost uh, was, was, was hugely significant in terms of contributing to their defeat. As brilliant as they were at their offensive you know, panzer operations and their defensive uh, operations, the big disadvantage they had against the Soviet army was, it was the insurgency that they had to fight. So all those three things work together to create, and why is there an insurgency? Because Hitler lost the story. And the story was that you guys are worse to me than Stalin, whatever, I would, I'm, I'm gonna treat you worse than Stalin, okay? Just letting you know. That story didn't work. Ukrainians fought really hard, not just against Germany, but, but, or, but also Stalin too, because they didn't want to be controlled by either one, but they had far more of an effect on the German military um, in, that, in that regard and played a huge part in, in the defeat of, of the German military. So if you look at the offensive, this is General Zelensky in Izium. I remember talking to American analysts, policymakers uh, before the offensive happened. I, I know some people that work in, 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 the, in the White House and you know, some of the top analysts of the Ukrainian military uh, in America that, that the, the policymakers and politicians listen to on a regular basis. And they all had this really big concern before the offensive in Kherson that's happening right now. Uh, can Ukraine pull off an effective offensive? Because we've been giving you all this, these weapons. And don't you think you should wait until you know, you're better trained and you know, maybe you don't need to do it as soon as you think? There's this huge debate um, with the Ukrainian military, the American military. And there was, it's now coming out, Ukraine had really ambitious plans. 
And, you, and U.S. military was saying, we don't think you can accomplish that in terms of the scale of the offensive they wanted to do. And they decided to pare back their offensive goals uh, to, to Kherson. But um, General uh, Sikorsky here, the, the land forces commander, apparently he had an idea that, okay, well, we, we can't do this big offensive we want to do all across the southern front in Zaporizhia and Kherson. We'll just do it in Kherson, but we got to do something somewhere else. And we need to have this, this big narrative around, and, and I remember at the time thinking, guys are making it really obvious you're about to attack in Kherson. Um, and Russia started to move troops all the way down from, from Kharkiv, from, from Donbass, all the way into, into Kherson. And, you know, everyone was saying, what's going on here? Like, this, this doesn't make a lot of sense. And then Ukraine uh, ends up replicating about seven or eight days after the Kherson offensive starts, they do the Battle of Izium, which is a complete replica of a 1942 campaign of the German army in, in Ukraine called Operation Citadel, where the, the Germans surrounded, uh, I think, four Soviet armies, um, or three or four armies uh, in, in that area on the exact same terrain, on the, on the Asokol River. And Ukraine basically replicated an old battlefield playbook. I, I, I'm, I can't wait to speak to General uh, Sikorsky one of these days after the war and interview him and ask him, did you dust off the old history book plans or not? But, but they saw the terrain and it was obvious. Um, and they created, uh, with this offensive, um, this lightning assault, which people had assumed because of the way the war was going, that the Russians and Ukrainians were just going to have this trench warfare over and over. And it, it was... There, the maneuver warfare wasn't going to happen anymore. And Ukraine completely blew that out of the water with the success of the Izium offensive. And you see now, as of 3 October, Lyman, Lehman just fall, fell. And now they're moving back into territories that Russia spent months conquering uh, in a matter of weeks. And what's happening because of this offensive? The West is now completely blown away. They're, they're in like envy of Ukraine and you have American army officers saying, man, I've never had a chance to do something cool like that in my career because we've just been fighting, you know, Arabs in Iraq and all they got is AK-47s. These Ukrainians are going to do these great imitations of German grand maneuver from World War II and we haven't had that, you know, there's all kinds of like professional jealousy going on now and it's, you know, and the Ukrainian military is, is now, everyone likes to back a winner. Oh, Here's some more weapons. And we, you know, we gave them these weapons and we're winning the war for them. And oh yeah, we advised them on their plan and we helped them war game it. And you know, we're calling in targeting advice, you know, because everyone wants to back a winner. And, and Ukraine knew, despite our fears of, oh, we really hope you don't screw up this offensive because if you do, we're not gonna give you any more weapons because we can't sell it to our public. But Ukraine also knew that they had to come up with something to change the narrative of the war, which is a successful offensive. And General Sikorsky had a lot of pushback from the rest of the staff, apparently. I can't wait to dig in and interview all these people and get that background. But he won the day. They took a big risk. And it paid off even, I think it exceeded their, their, their wildest expectations in terms of speed and the impact and the effect it's had. And what has it done? It's, it's forced Russia, basically, uh, to go all in. and try to change the narrative of the war with a mobilization um, that, you know, we all know is, is going to be impactful in some way. We don't know how it's going to play out. But um, that's how powerful offensive operations are and can be. And, and Ukraine knew that they had to be successful. You couldn't mess this one up. He's a, he's a pianist who, who was in the Azov, Azov stall plant, at the garrison defending. And this is one of the iconic pictures. You, you've seen many of the pictures from the Azovstal defenders. And um, these guys not only tied down several 10 plus thousand of Russia's best troops for eight weeks of the war, which could have probably destroyed the Ukrainian military in the Donbass if they weren't tied down in Mariupol. Uh, but more importantly, the story that got out with Starlink and thanks to Elon Musk and their regular broadcasts, their, the images that they sent out uh, created a legend, right? And, and this, 
this defense, even though they had to surrender and many of them were tortured and, and killed in captivity, this garrison that has now seen its leaders released and, and several of them released, they're going to live to create a legend, right? They're going to live to create that story. And I remember President Zelensky, when he told them to lay down arms, he said, you know, and they, they were following orders. They, they were willing to die to the last person, but, but then the, 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 the national leadership made a decision, okay, w you can't really do much more given all the situation, the resupplies, whatever, whatever military calculus came into it, President Zelensky and the last of the leadership said, your job now is to, li is to live, right? That, those are your new orders. Go into captivity and, and, and live through this because, and he said, you know, you, your lives are more important. And, more, and I think more importantly, their story um, about what happened is, is critical to the future of Ukraine. And the, the stories that these people are going to tell that they're already telling on, on social media, the, the pictures afterwards when he's released of his arm and, and some of the interviews, Aiden Aislinn, another a uh, guy who's a Marine, a British Marine, British volunteer who joined the, uh, several years ago joined the Ukrainian Marines, you know, he's been released also. They're talking and their stories about what's happened uh, and their release, the story around their release in Russia did not go down well. It, these guys are Nazis, why are we releasing them? Right, but President Zelensky managed to with his sales and marketing ability and getting Saudi princes and you know, oligarchs involved from Russia, was able to get that deal done. Um, that was a huge morale boost for Ukraine and a huge uh, absolute body blow to the, the nationalists on the Russian side who were furious with President Putin for trading um, prisoners to get these guys out. And you know who they got? They got Medvedev. <laughs> I mean, they got that guy back, right? Putin's. Uh, you know, uh, basically uh, mole or traitor or president in waiting for Ukraine, which uh, is the godfather of his daughter, who's completely useless now to him. Uh, well, maybe in his mythical, strange mind of what might happen, maybe he thinks he can install Medvedev in Ukraine in the future as a president. But, you know, this guy is dead. You know, he's dead politically in Ukraine. But um, that that is an amazing story. And it's the story of what they did and the way they got their story out and the, day, the way they're going to tell it afterwards, which is everything. Now, I don't have a lot of stories about the raids that are going on, except for ones that make it into the news. This is my favorite, watching Russian, <laughs> Russian uh, sunbathers run um, after the Saki Air Base in Crimea is destroyed. And this was right before the events have started. This was actually when Ukraine was in a real low moment, I think. Uh, the, the casualties just were really bad in the early parts of the summer. There was no sign that the offensive was about to start. And all of a sudden, the Saki Air Base in, in uh, Crimea gets blown up. And, and I think recently, the President Zeluzny's admitted that it was some kind of strike. He's been very vague on what it is, but, but Ukraine is responsible for this, whether it's special forces who were observing or did some attack with some suicide drones or, or kamikaze drones, or it was a long range weapon, the fact that it happened and you have Russian tourists running back and crying on social media about Ukraine vacation being, or their, their Crimea vacation being ruined, um, it had a huge impact on the national psyche of both countries. And these kind of raids, I remember when Osama bin Laden was killed in Afghanistan or Saddam Hussein was captured or, you know, uh, these big leaders that were killed in, in Iraq. And we, we actually, in my own unit, we killed a, a large, in a raid, we, we had our own incident where we killed a leader who, when he was killed, it made it on Iraqi national TV. Um, they have a huge psychological impact um, when generals or leaders or high value targets are, are, are killed and these, these High-end raids can make national news. They can change the mood of the war. They can change support for the war. Um, raids can be very big. I mean, these could be huge Cossack raiding parties and from Zaporizhia, you know, in, in, in the 1700s, you know, they had huge raiding parties, right? These, are, these can be big or small. Um, but raids are 
um, different than offensives and, and defensive operations because those are typically very large and, and you know, have many people involved. These can have not a lot of people involved, but can have huge strategic, operational, and tactical significance. So let's talk about Ukraine and, and your history because this is what I think is most important about this war is Ukraine deserves a better history. Now, I, I have two friends, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say both of their names because they both know who they are. Uh, and if they watch this, I'll, I'll get a chuckle out of it. And there, I have two friends from Ukraine, both good friends of mine, and I don't want them to meet, okay? Because Yuri, he's from uh, Zhitomyr, grew up speaking Russian, uh, served in, in Ukrainian military, um, and I like to go running with him. He was one of the first people I met when I came to Ukraine. We were born in the same year, five days apart, and grew up speaking Russian, but 2014, he you know, actually during the Orange Revolution and especially after 2014, he only speaks Ukrainian to his children. And um, he likes Stepan Bandera and he thinks Stepan Bandera is a, a great national hero for Ukraine, all right? And my other friend who lives in Kiev, um, he hates Bandera, okay? He can't stand this guy. And he said he killed a bunch of Jews and Poles and. And what he stands for, I think, is ripping Ukraine apart. Now, how much of that is true versus, you know, Putin-inspired uh, mythology about Bandera? I personally haven't read enough about him and done enough historical research uh, about him. So I'm, I'm actually speaking honestly about my historical knowledge on him. But I do know this. He's controversial. And I do know that when you say his name in Germany and Poland, you don't get a good reaction. Uh, especially when the German ambassador for Ukraine to Germany is praising Bandera in Germany. It's not, a good, it's not a good unifying thing. Whether or not that's fair to him or not, and to what he did, it's just the reality. And on the other side is uh, the Ukrainian First Army, which, which in, this is on uh, Victory Day after, uh, in June of 1945, these are the Red Army soldiers that made it all the way into Berlin. And actually, there's a bunch of Ukrainian graffiti still in the, the, the Reichstag or the, 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 uh, the parliament building in Germany uh, that's still preserved because Ukrainians were that prominent in, in the Red Army in terms of, I don't think Russia's ever won or will win a major war in the future without Ukrainians on their side, right? Because they're the best part of, of any Russian military campaign of the Ukrainians. And... You know, my wife, Katya, her, I remember on social media a few years ago on, on Victory Day, her mother posts a post about her great-grandfather who was with the Ukrainian First Army that went into Berlin. And that, what I wouldn't pay to speak to him if I had the opportunity and understand what he saw and what he went through, right? But, but those stories live inside of, you know, the, the, the family that he, he passed down. You know, they're, they're part of the DNA, whether you tell them or not, they're part of the DNA that you give to your children. So I'll, I'll have some of that coming from my children, I'm sure, because that's a very intense historical experience that's part of the Ukrainian history. Like it or not, sometimes when I talk to Ukrainians, I feel like you're, you're like a, a child of two divorced parents and you spent a while living with your mom you know, Poland and the great Lithuanian Commonwealth, and she was okay, but she did some stuff that didn't, you didn't like, and then you went and lived with your abusive alcoholic father, Russia, for a while, right? And, and it's like, you're angry about both of these things in different ways, you know, Bogdan Kamitsky, like he fights back against the Poles and gets your freedom, and then Russia betrays you, and then all of a sudden you don't have your freedom, and you end up fighting in all these wars that you know, weren't necessarily your, your own choice. Um, and having really horrible leaders, <laughs> you know, who, who didn't treat Ukrainians that well. But that's what makes Ukraine such a tough country right now, right? And, and I think my wish for Ukraine is that we can get past this divisive history and not demonize either side, but, but acknowledge the good and the bad that you got from each side the European side of your history, the Russian side of your history. I mean, Katya's mom teaches Russian literature, um, or she did, right? Because now that's not, not taught in schools. 
But think about all the, the contribution that Ukraine's made to Russian literature, to, to the intelligentsia. Some of that great literature that came out came from Ukrainians, you know, Gogol and, and the, the impact the Ukrainians had on Russian uh, thought and, and, and Russian civilization, whatever you, you call Russian civilization, is, I think, very powerful. And to disown that history and, and, and some of the accomplishments Ukrainians made inside the Russian empire, um, I think is tragic. And I think it, it's, not, it's not serving your national identity going forward. And what this war gives you, um, as horrible as war is, in terms of the human cost, is it gives you an opportunity to, to finally unify this history. And you have, rather than thinking of yourselves as some child of divorced parents who both have their flaws, Europe and Russia, let's flip the script and let's start imagining that you know, Yaroslav the Wise was actually the godfather of Europe. All of his daughters went out and taught the French to bathe and to read and, and, and really was the wealthiest empire of Europe at that time and, and made a huge impact on European history before uh, some bad times came upon it. In terms of Ukraine's um, decentralized nature, which, which had some strengths and, and weaknesses, and uh, its early uh, gifts to European civilization, you created Russia, and you know that. I mean, they, they came from Ukrainian civilization, and, and Europe was greatly impacted by Ukrainian civilization. And then you have Bogdan Kamitsky, who created with, with the Cossacks, and this is where Kiev Mohilanska gets its, its heritage from, that this time period, um, this idea that we're gonna live free. And the first real free communities in Europe that demanded and, and created a written constitution came in Ukraine with Pep Orlok. And that tr tradition in Ukraine, um, it's not about whether you speak Ukrainian, it's not about whether you speak Russian, it's not about any of that. It's really about, I think, a higher ideal. And what Ukraine has, I remember when I came to the square, uh, the, the trade union house in, in 2014 was burned down and, and they had this they were rebuilding it for several years, and, and on, on the building it said, freedom is our religion. And that, that sign always had a big impact on me because that's what I think Ukraine has that can unify these two different sides of Ukraine. The, you know, there's this, my friend Platon who doesn't like Bandera, um, but has volunteered a, a ton since the war started to help the Ukrainian military and done a lot of stuff, and his family's donated a lot of money. Uh, he, he says it very well. He says, you know, all these Russian speakers in the East who've been told that they're not real Ukrainians because they don't speak Ukrainian at home, they're the ones suffering the most. And they're the ones fighting for Ukraine. And they're the only reason that Ukraine still exists as a state. So let's stop criticizing them and telling them because of their language, they're not real Ukrainians. And my wife, she grew up speaking Russian, but she speaks Ukrainian now with her best friend. And it's Funny for both of them, but they're 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 really getting used to it and getting into it. Uh, it's not like a lot of people who grew up in those parts of of Ukraine don't want to, you know, now be more Ukrainian in terms of maybe their language or or some some other traditions. But you shouldn't ask them to disown that part of themselves that comes from Russian civilization that's stronger in the East. And this war gives Ukraine, an, uh, I think, a unique opportunity to create um, this history that transcends a specific language. And yes, Ukrainian should be the national language of Ukraine. Everyone should learn it. I'm not saying you know, it's not important for a state to have that. But you have a lot of people, my friend Steve here, who, who's moved to Ukraine from the United States, myself, who are moving here and they're drawn to this country because you've showed us all something. I think Americans are secretly jealous. We're, we're like that old flabby athlete and Ukraine's like this young like superstar rising up showing us what freedom's all about and, and that's what we were founded on. Same thing with Britain. I think Britain and America especially, some of your biggest fans, they're like this old kind of washed up democracy that's trying to figure out if they still have it. 
And, and you have the opportunity, we in Ukraine, with people from all over the world who don't speak Ukrainian, who are from the West, who are going to come here and they're going to want a lot of things in, in English, right? And they should learn Ukrainian. A lot of them will. Some never will. But you're going to have this, this strange phenomenon where people from all over the world are going to want to come visit Ukraine. They might stay here because they fall in love with the country when they come here. And you're going to have this, you can't afford to just, if you don't speak Ukrainian and you don't eat borscht and all this kind of stuff, then you're not Ukrainian. I like borscht. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> you got to have the right woman cook it for you. But yes, you're right. Um, but Ukraine has this opportunity to be something far more than you've ever imagined. And that's, that's what I'd like us all to, to take from this, this, this course is the stories we tell ourselves about this war, the stories we share with our friends about what we see on social media, the, the stories you have if you participated as a soldier, as a volunteer, all of that's important because if you tell those stories to people who didn't experience it, who come after us or who are watching it from far away and decide to help Ukraine or tell their politicians in their country to help Ukraine, it's gonna make a difference. And people in America are, the more they get to know Ukraine or people who've been here like Steve and I, they're just becoming bigger and bigger fans. And uh, that's the opportunity here is to become what America once was and is trying to regain and, and I think living vicariously through Ukraine by supporting you and thinking bigger than the past disagreements over history. And, and I think President Zelensky has made a lot of mistakes in, in the war and he would admit he's not perfect. Um, and after the war, there's gonna be a political sc scramble and people are gonna attack him for, th for mistakes he made. He may or may not get reelected. But what Ukraine can't go back to and what it should not allow itself to do is just tearing uh, ourselves apart about a history that, you know, we have a unifying history now. And, and people from the East who don't speak Ukrainian at home um, are sacrificing for the entire country and people from the West who speak Ukrainian are going out and volunteering and taking in people from the East. And, you know, this is not a real opportunity. And if, if we, if you squander, and I say we, because Ukraine is where I want to live and raise my family, uh, it's, it's going to be a real tragedy. And that's really the opportunity that's, that's been presented here. And you as journalism students, as future journalists, uh, leaders in Ukrainian society. Kiev Mohilanska is like the intelligentsia of Ukraine comes from here, right? Um, what kind of stories are you gonna tell as politicians, as, as leaders? Uh, are you gonna tear each other apart because you didn't go to Kiev Mohilanska and you're not Ukrainian enough, right? You guys have a reputation, okay? You went to Taras Shevchenko, that's not cool enough, right? Or, or oh, you went to somewhere out east, uh, you must be, you know, really bad, right? So, so we, we have a choice to make. And this is exactly why I'm teaching this course. What, is, what if this is the greatest story that's ever told? And the story's not over. President Zelensky on 22 August, he's really good at this stuff. He had a parade of Russian tanks that were supposed to be parading down Krushatik. And, you know, he gave his talk on 22 August. And there's a lot of this war's not over yet, and we know that there it could be a lot worse uh, for Ukraine. I think Ukraine definitely is going to win, but the, this, the question still is what's the cost going to be, and how bad is it going to get? And we have to help write that story by participating in it in, in, in all of our small ways. Uh, we're, we're not all President Zelensky, who has a huge impact, but. Everyone knows someone who's, who's fighting, everyone knows someone who's volunteering, everyone's doing their part, and we, we all have a role to play. And the way you can play a role, if you're watching this, uh, is the reason I'm teaching this, this course here on uh, war and storytelling at, at Kiev Mohilanska uh, Journalism Department is, I'm a historian, but I realize the first draft of history is written by journalists, and uh, when the war started, this is me at the Kiev train station on 22 February um, or 12 February. I evacuated my, my company, which was a tech company I was running. And I knew this was coming because I was watching the intelligence online. And uh, when the war started, I was with Katya, my wife in, in, in 
Poland and it immediately became clear to me that I was no longer interested in running a tech company and I wanted to, in some small way, try and help what's going on. So we started the Borderlands Foundation, which initially was just focused on evacuating people because we thought uh, that the war was going to be mainly about getting people out, but then Ukraine obviously uh, su surpassed all expectations and a lot of people didn't need to leave. So we formed a nonprofit uh, in America and in Europe now. We got approved in both America and Europe to be a, a foundation. Uh, and I decided to make it into a historical center. And what I want to create, it, well, storytelling center on war and storytelling is take the framework that I'm teaching here, recruit students, uh, to help work in the foundation and help people tell their stories. So what I'd like to do is take Mihailo and, and all these people from who want to tell their stories and, and sit them down and interview them and translate those stories into English and uh, put subtitles under, under them when they're speaking uh, and put those stories out there and, and make these stories available for anyone who wants to use them, documentary, filmmakers, uh, news media, but basically be a center where, a center where people can tell their stories uh, in rich, uh, well-lighted, well-shot media um, so that their story will be remembered. And uh, that's, what I, that's what we're setting up. We're, we're, this is why I'm teaching here is to uh, help, help me get the word out about the center, recruit some people who wanna help, and tell these stories uh, and eventually uh, provide material for anyone who wants to write books, whether it's you guys or uh, myself. I've got a few books I'd like to try one of these days, documentary films, uh, or also even um, after the war, uh, bringing people from all over the world to Ukraine to see what happened here. Um, we call them historical experiences or in the army, we call them staff rides where you'd study the battles that, that happened so you can see what people experienced, meet some of the people who were there, uh, see Ukraine, you know, all these great places I've never been that I can't wait to see, like watermelon country in Kherson, and uh, the, the great national forests of Izium and Kharkiv and all that area. Um, and you know, show people Ukraine, because I think when people come to Ukraine after two weeks, they'll fall in love with the country and want to support it, you know, donating the second part of the center. So first is storytelling, documenting stories, putting it out there on the, online, on YouTube, on websites. Second part is history is made by people who sacrificed a lot. So allowing people to donate directly to Mikhailo, the pianist, give him money, you know, for whatever you want. Let, give him money for his two, $2 a month, $100 a month, whatever you want to donate to him for what he did for Ukraine and the world directly. We've built the software to allow you to donate directly to anyone who we put on our platform that we say that yeah, this is a real person who we talk to and you know they've they fought in the war and they've told their story and here it is and donate to them and uh, that's that's the second part is supporting the veterans directly they don't have to be veterans if it's a family that was impacted by the war got caught up in it uh, we'll tell their story too there's unfortunately plenty of those tragic stories too but really allowing the people who are most impacted by the war to benefit from people who like this history, and if you're like me and like reading history, um, you obviously will, will wanna, I think, donate to the people who helped make that history happen. Um, and then the final part of it is really uh, promoting Ukraine as a, as a country, because ultimately so many people around the world can learn from these battlefield experiences, military officers, politicians, Leaders of any organization could learn leadership lessons from what's happened here. Uh, and when they come here, I think they're gonna wanna open offices in Ukraine or, or invest here or even move here, like Steve and some other people. And that's gonna create, uh, for me, um, you know, my legacy, I think history should be used to make history. History should create a better future. Uh, it's gonna be a very active, uh, historical center that, that's going to be designed to help policymakers, leaders of Ukraine go somewhere to learn about what really happened here, contribute to it, draw from that experience, uh, join, pass on their lessons to other people. Uh, look forward to sitting down with President Zelensky, General Sikorsky, General Zeluzny, all these guys, one of these days when they're not busy, uh, 
and getting them on camera and getting their stories too uh, to benefit this. So uh, that's the, the vision I look forward to sharing with you every week. We'll dive into each principle of war and, and really analyze each one of them very deeply in, in subsequent lessons. And I'll keep reminding you who are, who are watching online or you know, throughout Kiev Mohilanska, we're recruiting. So if you want to be an interviewer, or you're a journalism student, you're, you're going to be, as we said in the Army, voluntold. I'm just going to tell you, no, you can volunteer. Uh, but, but love to get journalism students practice of interviewing people a lot, because that's where we want to bring in a lot of people to get interviewed. If you're a developer, we need software developers for our software, which we keep developing to, to give direct donations to people, so software engineers. If you're a sociologist or historian, any of you, we can, we can have you involved in the center. If you, if you can sit down with someone, empathize with them, and shut up and let them tell their story, you'll be useful. So, so that's who we're recruiting for the center, and I, I can't wait to work with this great student body that you know, is from the, the intellectual tradition that created what Ukraine's famous for, freedom and the Cossack spirit in Ukraine and, and the world. I think the world, everyone's going to become big Ukrainian digital nomad Cossacks. They're all going to want to come live here and you know, blockchain and be free and not pay a lot of taxes and uh, live free or die. That kind of, those kind of people from all over the world, I think, will come and live in Ukraine and, and will be the center uh, that helps tell that story. So, well, thank you everyone for joining and uh, thank you for your attention. And I look forward to uh, sharing with you the rest of the principles of war and, and getting to know all of you uh, in the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you.